Welcome back guys to another video don't forget to subscribe and let's started chapter 1, lost chapter 1 infamous vigilante, shadow strikes again, today at relatively 6 pm, the well known vigilante, shadow, took down one of the largest drug cartels in Japan, Musodafa, the vigilante, who has been escaping police and hero custody for two years now, evaded once again capturing, however, we need to, ask ourselves, with everything that he's done for Japan, can we really consider Shadow a villain? Tell us your opinion Izawa turned his television off with a huff, it's been two years since the first appearance of Shadow, a mysterious vigilante that always manages to escape both the police and the hero's grasp. It's been almost two years since Izawa, better known as the underground hero. Eraserhead joined the pursuit of the vigilante. Shadow is one of the very few people that ever managed to escape him. Shadow always gets the job done never lingers long enough to get captured and most importantly never leaves any trace behind, except for the usual note, that was either really useful in their cases or just another joke. Izawa was getting more and more frustrated by the day. This vigilante isn't like the others, he's gained a lot of support from the public. He made a name for himself by patrolling the slums and the neglected part of the city. Places where heroes don't usually go. Also, by taking down the villains that the heroes don't realize exists until they're caught. As time went by, people started calling out for him. They started calling for the shadow, the hooded figure that somehow always manages to hear their call for help. He was a hero to most people but a damn frustrating one in Shouta's opinion. He was cut off from his line of thought when his phone vibrated in his pocket. There, in bold letters on his screen was the name of the detective in charge of the vigilante's case. Speak of the devil. I guess, he thought bitterly as he answered the call. Tsukachi, is there a reason you are calling me at this hour? His usual monotone voice didn't betray the slight curiosity he felt. Eraserhead, Shadow was just spotted stopping a store robbery on 24th Street. If we go now, we can ambush him. I'll be there. He replied, his tone serious and calm. This was their chance. Maybe they can finally find out who he was. He'd make sure that. This time, this time would be different. This time, he was going to catch the slippery bastard. Izawa picked up his capture gear and with that, he was on his way. He had a vigilante to catch after all. Izuka believes that today was a good day. An exhausting day, but a good day nonetheless. Today he had finally put an end to one of the drug cartels that used to rule the streets of Musodafu. It's been three months since he initially started their pursuit and he finally managed to put an end to their crimes. However, his day didn't end there because not half an hour ago, he was caught up in an armed robbery down the 24th street. Some idiots thought it would be easy to just steal from the old lady working there. Man were they wrong. Izuka can still hear their high-pitched screams as they tried to run away from the granny with the knife quirk. Yet, he couldn't help the bad feeling he was getting. Years of experience made his instincts as sharp as ever. He learned to trust them and they have never failed him, once. He just hoped that whatever was about to happen, he would get through it unscathed. As he ran, jumping from roof to roof, he tried to listen in for any kind of distressing noise. Over the years, he had honed his senses and trained his powers. He was able to hear everything around him. From the news playing in the living room of some civilians a couple of blocks from here, to the heartbeats of the people currently walking in the streets below him. Izuku likes his night patrols. He likes the quiet. He made sure to always be on high alert though, if someone needed help, he'd be there. It's been two years since he started hitting the streets as Shadow, a hooded vigilante. His training and hard work had paid off, enabling him to finally make a difference and help people, even though it was illegal. He didn't really have any other choice though, did he? He jumped down an empty alley, deciding that he was done for the day. However, whatever plans he had were shot out the window as soon as he felt a slight change of wind behind him. He could hear the all-too-familiar heartbeat of the underground hero himself. Eraser head. Ducking to the ground and rolling, he easily avoided the capture weapon that was being thrown his way. He could hear a huff coming from the man that was now standing in front of him. It's over shadow, give yourself up. The police are surrounding the place. The hero said, his voice neutral, tone calm. However, Izuku could hear the slight alteration in his heartbeat, betraying his calm demeanor. Yet, it indicated no sign of lying. Izuku stayed silent. This was the first time, the hero managed to get this close to him. Now, 
You may be wondering how a 14-year-old teenager ended up being an infamous vigilante. They say that it takes losing everything you love to realize what they truly mean to you. This is the story of how Izuka Midoriya lost everything he ever loved. The blazing sun beats down on the concrete floor of the neighborhood sidewalk. Izuka Midoriya limps home, his posture stiff, shoulder hunched and head down as his mind goes through the events of the past few hours. Today was a particularly bad day for the green-haired boy, Bakugo or as he liked to call him, Kukan, was a little more aggressive than usual. The 10-year-old in question was playing in the school playground with his other classmates while Izuka gingerly wrote in his notebook with colored crayons. The greenette hummed under his breath the familiar tune of All Might's theme song as he analyzed one of the latest up-and-coming pro heroes that had just recently debuted. However, his concentration was interrupted as shouting was heard coming from the swings. Izuka, having grown accustomed to the blonde boy's behavior, immediately got up to deal with whatever the explosive boy was up to. Despite their young age, kids could be cruel. Bakugu was towering over a small kid, explosions going off in his palms as he laughed maniacally. Kukin's quirk was a powerful one, he had the ability to create explosions by detonating his own sweat. The explosions, albeit small at the moment, would cause great damage in the future if trained properly. It was the perfect quirk for heroes and the blonde sure as hell knew that. In this day, and in our society, quirks defined a person and thus determined their fate. People with powerful quirks were bound to take positions of power. Their place forever amongst the most respected and feared individuals, they would take up jobs in the government or become heroes, living and relishing in the spotlight. However, people with weak quirks were destined to be at the service of those with powers. In this society, Izuku found himself at the bottom of the food chain. Destined to be shunned and looked down upon by society's worst individuals. He did not have a strong quirk, in fact, he did not have one at all. Izuku looked at the scene before him. The kid was trembling under Bakugo's glare, his eyes were cast down, tears rolled freely down his bruised cheeks as he apologized for whatever he had done to piss the ten-year-old off. The blonde wasn't having any of it though. Bakugo's palm started to crackle, small explosions slowly making their way towards the vulnerable boy, the latter seemed to be frozen from fear as he prepared himself for the impendent pain. Before he thought better of it, Izuku was already running towards them. His small body instantly blocking the path of the explosive boy, his arms were held up in front of him in a makeshift defensive stance as he acted as a living shield for the kid behind him. Now, staggering home from that exceptionally bad beating, he thought that maybe, it wasn't the best idea to provoke the boy with the explosion quirk. He had no regrets though, at least the other kid got to run away mostly unscathed. He wanted to be a hero after all and heroes saved people even if it meant getting hurt themselves. Izuku stepped inside their small apartment, he pulled on the hem of his shirt, making sure that all of his bruises were carefully hidden from his mother's gaze. He plastered on his most convincing smile and stepped into the kitchen, calling a brief greeting to alert her of his presence. He didn't want his mother to worry about him, she had enough on her plate. Her job was exhausting. Her shifts long and tiring. However, she couldn't raise her son on her own otherwise. Being a single mother was hard. Being the single mother of a quirkless kid was even harder. Apparently, his smile wasn't as convincing as he would have liked it to be because as soon as she turned towards him, she froze. Her smile immediately faltered as her brows shut up in surprise. Many emotions swirled in her. Olive green eyes. Shock, confusion, worry, and finally painful understanding. The emotions were quickly overlapped by the blatant worry she was feeling. Izuka felt a pang of guilt for being the reason behind his mother's frown. He tried to say something, anything to placate her worries but before he could manage a single word, he was engulfed in a bear hug. His mother, despite her small and slim figure, was a steady and strong presence in his life. She always knew when there was something wrong with him and she always found a way to make him feel better. Hey sweetie, what's wrong? She asked tentatively, her voice was soft and gentle. She would not push if he didn't feel like talking at the moment. Aye aye, it's just... Today was a long day mom. Can we talk later? His words were barely above. A whisper but she heard them nonetheless. Well, we will have to talk about it later baby, okay. A small nod was her only response. How about we go out for ice cream? There's this new All Might shop that opened, it's a bit far but I could drive us there? Put on your favorite music while we drive? The boy brightened up at that, 
His mother really did know how to cheer him up. He nodded feverishly before hugging her and rushing upstairs to put his bag down. The sun was setting by the time they reached the highway, the ride was silent, peaceful. Izuku listened to the soft tune coming from the radio as Inko hummed to the song that was playing in a low, soothing voice. He gazed onto the slideshow of pine trees and distant lights they were passing. The city illuminations and ambience were beautiful. He was so lost in thought that he barely registered the loud honk that startled him out of his reverie, followed by the blinding light that came from his mom's window, rapidly approaching towards them. It all happened so fast, yet, it felt like everything was happening in slow motion like someone had stopped the flow of time. The moment forever suspended and frozen. The next events would be forever engraved in Izuka's mind. The impact was abrupt and violent, the world swirled around them, turned upside down as the car swerved and tumbled on the road. Glass flew everywhere, multiple shards grazing his cheek and arms as he tried to cover his face. His attempts proved feeble as his whole body was being jostled and his stomach strained against his seatbelt. Izuku registers things in vague awareness, he feels his stomach twist as pain erupt in his side. His head throbs and he feel dampness spread on his shirt and down his forehead. He tried to open his eyes but some kind of liquid was hindering his attempts. That proved to be the wrong thing to do though, because as soon as he opened them he regretted it, pain flared in his pupils. His eyes stung horribly, the sensation excruciating. His eyes burned, it felt as if they were on tried to scream but no sound would come out, his breath caught in his throat as tears rolled down his face. His vision was dimming, black spots dancing in his eyes as he tried to make the aching stop. Slowly all light had left his eyes, the world quickly bathed in deep, endless darkness. He couldn't see. Why couldn't he see? Why were his eyes burning? Where was his mom? Whatever. Reasoning the boy tried to convey was overlapped by the overwhelming sense of pain pain pain. He tried calling out for his mother but his cries were answered by painful silence. The pain in his eyes was increasing, the aching turning into pure agony as he tried to rub at his pupils, as he tried to find any way to make it stop. His breathing was getting more and more constricted by the second as he dissolved into a state of utter fear and panic. The pain was unbearable, more than a mere child could handle. Then it all stopped. Consciousness escaped the boy as he finally succumbed to his miserable state. Inko jolted into awareness with a start, omnipresent scent of chemicals accosted her senses. Her first thoughts were hazy and confused. What had happened? Where was she? Realization dawned on her as she finally took in her surroundings. She had been driving when a truck swerved and crashed to the side of her car. Her eyes widened as she gasped in worry. She tried to turn around to check on Izuku but her seatbelt was digging into her side. She tried taking it off but her attempts were useless. The pain too much to handle every time she moved. However, this was her son and she needed to make sure he was okay. She tried calling out to him but got no response. Concern and fear gnawed at her insides as she thought of the possible states her son could be in. He was fine right? He was alive, right? Oh no, what if no? Her movements were getting frantic, she needed to save her son, she needed to help him. She heard footsteps coming towards them and felt the car jostle slightly as a figure suddenly emerged from the window next to her. She felt relief flood her system. Someone was here. Someone could save Izuku. The man had long black hair and deep bags under his eyes. She couldn't see any emotions in the man's features but somehow his calm and collected attitude reassured her that they would be okay. Yet, she couldn't stop worrying. Her baby wasn't responding and what if he was badly hurt? He needed help. The man spoke, he was asking her to stay still so he could get her out and then get to her son. Did he want to get her out before Izuku? Anything else the man said didn't seem important. Her son comes first. And no, Izuku, you need to help him first. You need to make sure he's okay. He comes first, please. The man seemed to think about it for a second before he merely nodded and got to work. She watched as the man carried a bloodied and battered Izuku out of the car, gently laying him on the ground a couple of meters away from the car. She could feel the heat coming from the back seat. Now, Inko seemed to realize what the man meant when he said that the car was at risk of catching fire. The chemicals that were spilled from the truck had seeped into the car. She couldn't bring herself to care though. Her baby was safe. He was going to be okay and that's all that mattered after all right? She smiled to herself, thinking of her sweet and loving son. She hoped he'd be okay without her, 
He was strong. He would be okay. That was her last thought as she felt the heat increase and, in an instant, the car exploded. The chemicals, highly flammable, had reached the fire that erupted in the engines. Izuku was just 10 when he lost everything. Izuku wakes up with a jolt. His breath gets caught in his throat as he gets assaulted instantly by the strong smell of antiseptics and disinfectants. It's dark, he can't see. Why can't he see? There's something on his face. His arms lift up to cup his head and he can feel bandages wrapped around his eyes. Everything around him feels amplified. The sheets between his fingers scrape against his skin uncomfortably and he's painfully aware of every little thing that's happening around him. There's a loud dripping sound near him, he flinches as every drop is just too loud. Everything feels too loud. He holds his hands up to cover his ears, he just can't take it anymore. His head throbs with the onslaught of information he's retaining all at once. Complete darkness, beyond black surrounds him. He can feel the vibration of everything around him. The way the heart monitors beeps and buzzes, the sound rhythmic and grounding. He feels the electric current going through the walls and the lights, even though he doesn't see them. He slowly glances around and he's startled to actually see something. It's still dark, it's still agonizingly empty but he sees it. He sees the sound waves that echo all around him. The dripping sound is coming from the four drip next to him, it seems that he's in a hospital room. Every drip gives him a clearer image of the room. Why was he in a hospital? His heart rate picks up, the monitor quickly becoming overbearingly loud. He remembers the car ride, he remembers his mother's voice, soothing and soft as she hummed to his favorite song. He remembers white and the world spinning all around them. Mom, where was she? Was she okay? He tries to get up but a searing pain from his side sends him tumbling to the floor with a thud. He wheezes and clutches his abdomen as he tries to ride out the pain. He can't see. Why can't he see? He feels dampness on his face as tears start rolling from his eyes. He just wanted his mom. Where was she? Why wasn't she here? He can feel vibrations coming from outside the room, people approaching, coming and going. He hears a loud beating sound. He's too focused on the rhythmic beating that he doesn't notice when a figure enters his room. A hand on his shoulder startles him, the scare sends him scurrying away from the contact. He realizes with a jolt that the beating sound is the person's heartbeat. The sound echoes through the room and he can vaguely see the person's silhouette. The shape is feminine, he can see the slight curve of her figure. The woman's voice confirms his doubts. Midoriya Kun, you're awake. I'm Nurse Yuri, you need to lay down. You are still recovering and moving around will only make it worse. Her voice is firm and her touch is gentle as she slowly guides him towards the bed. Where's my mom? I want my mom. He asks quietly, his voice barely above a whisper. The doctor's heart clenches at the sight before her. The boy is wrapping his arms around himself as if trying to hide, to make himself as small as possible. Midoriya Kun. Your mom didn't make it. I'm sorry, the hero that rescued you did everything he could. Do you remember what happened before? She asks carefully, not wanting to overwhelm the boy. No no mom can't be gone. She she can't? We were going for ice cream, my mom wanted to cheer me up so she took me for a ride in the car. We went out because of me? We were driving when something came crashing into us and everything was white and I couldn't see any more a eh? and it. It burned and mom wasn't answering me and I kept shouting for her but she wouldn't respond and I I can't see. Why can't I see? Izuku was hyperventilating by now, his breathing coming out as short gasps. His words getting louder and faster as he remembered the horrible events he went through. It's all my fault. No, mom's gone and it's my fault. He wailed, his head rocketing back and forth as he dissolved into a hysterical mess. Everything was just too loud, he couldn't believe his mother was gone. She was everything he had. The doctor crouched in front of him and held him by the shoulders. Her grip was solid but light. The contact anchoring Izuku back to reality as she helped him breathe. Midoriya Khan, you need to breathe with me. One, two, three. Come on deep breathe. You're fine. You're safe. It's not your fault. Your mom loved you. It wasn't your fault. She spoke softly as she held him in her arms, gently rubbing circles down his back. Izuku doesn't know how much time they passed as the nurse slowly worked him out of his panic attack. He'd gotten lost in her beating heartbeat as he tried to steady his breathing and follow the rhythm of the loud thumb against her chest. When he was calm enough, she gently pushed the exhausted boy back onto the bed, 
making sure to make him as comfortable as possible. Sleep overtook him as bone-deep exhaustion set in his entire being. Her heart ached at the thought of what this child still had to face. He appeared so small, in that big hospital bed. So vulnerable. Life could be cruel. The next time Izuka woke up, the sounds around him felt more subsided. He felt as if he had more control over his senses. Although, everything was still too loud. He took in a deep breath and tried to focus. Slowly but surely the things around him were starting to take form. He focused on the things happening in his room only and it was working. His head didn't hurt as hard as before and his mind didn't feel overwhelmed. Izuka was just so tired. His mother was the only person that truly loved him and cared about him. The only person that truly mattered to him, and she was gone. Dead. It just felt so unreal, like this was just some horrible nightmare that he'd wake up from. He hoped he could just wake up and go looking for his mother. He'd hug her, he'd never let her go. Alas, this was not a nightmare, not like the ones you wake up from at least. This kind of nightmare was the one that stayed with you, the one that never ended. The ones you'd never wake up from. A couple of minutes passed, as he sat there, in complete silence and darkness, alone. Was this what life was going to be for him from now on? Was he permanently blind? Why weren't the doctors saying anything to him? Did they think he'd break? As soon as he finished his train of thought, a knock on the door pulled him out of his reverie. The door opened and a tall man walked in. Izuku could tell from the shape of the figure, the way the sound waves resounded from his every movement. The beating of his heart was steady, the rhythm maintaining some kind of coolness in his composure. Hello young Midoriya, my name is Dr. Hiro. You came in here with some pretty serious injuries. I must say, it's a miracle we managed to get to you in time. However, I may have some bad news. His only response was a soft grunt, dull green eyes continued to stare at the ceiling, unseeing. The doctor took it as his cue to continue. First of all, as you may have already noticed, the accident had damaged your retinas beyond repair. I'm afraid you are permanently blind. His blunt statement didn't get any reaction either, since Izuku had already known that much. The truck that hit your mother's vehicle was carrying toxic chemical substances. At the moment of impact, the driver had unconsciously used his cork atom reconstruction and changed the chemical structure of the liquid. We don't know what he did specifically but it seems the toxins were rendered to a higher level of toxicity. Some of the liquid had seeped into your vehicle, effectively getting into both your eyes and your system. Izuku shifted slightly at the new information. Was this the reason behind his newfound senses? Did the combination of both the driver's quirk and the chemicals alter his DNA? My system. He asked quietly, Izuku had an idea of what it meant but he had to be sure. Yes, I'm afraid that you were exposed to the chemicals long enough for it to get into your system. The chemicals, being of a new and unheard of construction, made it impossible for us to properly extract it from your body to test out or alter. When Izuku made a confused sound, the doctor seemed to realize that he was indeed speaking to a 10-year-old. What I mean to say Midoriya-kun is that the toxins have found their way into your bloodstream and into your organs. The chemicals in your system are slowly destroying your cells. Now, with the help of our medical staffs and a couple of healing quirks, we've managed to slow down the process as much as we could. We estimate about 8 years before your organs begin to shut down permanently Midoriya. Hiro knew he was being harsh, telling a 10-year-old kid that he had roughly 8 years left to live. However, it was necessary, the kid didn't have any other living relative and seemed aware enough to comprehend the seriousness of the situation. At least this way, he'd know not to waste the precious time he still had. Izuku could only sit there as his life crumbled around him. He could only sit there, frozen as it shattered into a million tiny pieces that could never be mended. His mother was gone, his sight was gone. His future too, it seems. He let the tears roll freely down his cheeks as he wished for his mother to come back. To hug him and tell him that everything was going to be okay. That he'd wake up from this and that it'll all be just a nightmare. Alas, it wasn't. It wasn't a nightmare because this wasn't something he could wake up from. This was. Something worse, this, he could never escape. Everything I loved became everything I lost. Izuku was 10 when he lost everything he ever loved chapter 2, shimmering hope it dawns on you, one day, how beautifully fragile we truly are. A single moment is all it takes to alter who we are, forever. Yet, we never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory, 
destined to fade as time slowly ebbs away. Izuka learned just how precious life really was in that fateful night. It took losing everything he ever loved for him to finally see how truly short and priceless life was. Losing her was like having a hole shot straight through his heart, a painful, constant reminder of an absence he could never fill. He would henceforth, walk this earth, if only for a short time, completely and utterly, alone. This beautiful and stunning world, which he will never be able to see again, will go on without him. He will not be able to watch the sunset as his mother hums to her favorite song on the radio. He will never be able to see the mountain tops, the pine trees, the world. It's been two weeks since the incident, nurses are starting to give up on interacting with him. This boy, once full of vibrant life was nothing more than a husk of the person he once was. Izuku had completely shut himself off, he'd only respond if addressed directly. His answers were short and straight to the point. His voice quiet. Tone icy as dull green eyes stared into complete darkness. His now milky green eyes held an emptiness that no kid should ever have. His gaze spoke of sadness and loneliness but also of pure and blatant anger. Anger at the world who took everything away from him. The world that took his mother, his sight, and his dreams away. His lifelong dream of becoming a hero before the accident felt attainable, hard but not impossible. No one believed a quirkless kid could ever be a hero but he was going to show them how wrong they were. However, now, sitting here, in his hospital bed, blind, and alone with only about eight years to live, that dream seemed so far out of his reach. The social worker came in yesterday, informing him, that given the fact that he had no other known family members and they couldn't get a hold of his father, he'd be sent to the local orphanage as soon as he was fully recovered. She assured him that they'd give him whatever he needed to cope with his blindness. The hospital had already provided for him a proper walking stick. However, they didn't know that he didn't actually need it. Over the past few days, he'd gotten the hang of controlling his senses, at least, to an extent where he wasn't constantly overwhelmed by the onslaught of information his brain was receiving all at once. They didn't know about the abilities he gained from the chemicals in his system. The chemicals that were slowly killing him had altered his DNA apparently. The doctors didn't know how it was possible and what would be the consequences but it happened nonetheless. He was somehow able to visualize the sound waves coming from any movement around him, whether it was the slow gust of wind coming from the window, to the heartbeats of every living thing in his vicinity. He could smell the perfume of the head nurse even if she was at the other end of the hospital. He could sense the swift flow of energy and electricity humming in the walls, count the people present in the building by visualizing the heat coming from their bodies. His senses were heightened to an unnatural degree, he didn't know what else the chemicals had changed but he'd make sure to find out as soon as they let him out of this place. He couldn't wait to leave the hospital. The people here were treating him like glass and he hated that. He hated being handled as if he would break. You're already broken. A voice in his head whispered. He shook his head, trying to kick those thoughts away. He wasn't broken, he couldn't be. He needed to be strong. He wondered what life was going to be like now, trying as hard as he could to ignore the dread pooling in his guts. He hopes whatever life had in store for him now, it won't be that bad right? His life couldn't get any worse right? He hoped so. Soon enough, he found himself being ushered into an old mansion. He could feel the dampness in the walls, smell the mold and weeds that were surely growing in the cracks of the building's walls. He followed the social worker up the stairs, leading to the main entrance, his walking stick clicking with each step. The woman opened the front door, the wood creaking as it scrapped the floor with a hiss. Hesitantly, he walked into the house in which he'd stay until he was, hopefully, adopted. From now on, this would be his home. He hoped the people here were nice, that they'd care for him, maybe become his family. However, a part of him knew that no matter what, he'd never get back the feeling of being cared for loved, as his mother once did. He'd never get back the feeling of pure and unfiltered safety. An old woman greeted them in at the reception desk. She stood quite tall and slim, her short hair was styled in a neat bun. Izuka gulped as he felt her eyes land on him. Her gaze sent chills down his spine. Even though Izuka couldn't see the details of her features, he could feel the frown that adorned her face. Hello, I'm assuming this is the boy you were talking about. Her voice was low yet stern her tone cold and unwavering as she ignored him, her attention solely focused on the woman beside him. Yes, Miss Akane. This is the kid we informed you about, his mother recently died in a car. 
crash. As you can see, the accident rendered him blind as well. I see. Well, step forward boy. She demanded in the same cold tone. He slowly made his way towards her, stopping short of a few steps in front of her. Well, are you going to introduce yourself? Such manners will not be tolerated in my orphanage. Hello, my name is Midoriya Izuku. It's nice to meet you, miss. His voice didn't waver, his tone rivaling the woman before him in its dullness. She hummed in acknowledgement, he could feel her eyes piercing through him, taking in his appearance, her gaze analyzing and judging him. If you are to stay here, you will follow my every order, you will respect the house rules and make sure to do everything I say. I will not tolerate delinquence and disobedience. Understood. She asked in a steeled voice, leaving no room for argument. Yes, ma'am. He responded immediately, his voice lower than he would have preferred. You will refer to me as Miss Akane. Am I clear? His only response was a nod to the head. Clearly, the wrong thing to do. You will speak when spoken to. Yes, ma Miss Akane. Seemingly satisfied by his response, she called one of the receptionists over. Now, you will follow Miss Luna here upstairs, to your room. Make sure to pay attention boy, she will not be there every time you need to move. Your blindness is no excuse for incompetence. With that, she walked away. He stood there, now noticing the absence of the social worker, she must have left earlier. The receptionist, Miss Luna, her voice was soft. Hello there, Midoriya. Don't mind Miss. Akane, she's just a little strict. Now, follow me. Your room is upstairs. But I'm guessing you'd want to explore a little. Taking a hold of her hand they slowly made their way upstairs. He could tell the woman was uncomfortable, her breathing was slightly different. She led him to his room, his senses taking in his surroundings, making sure he memorized everything around him. He was going to live. Here, after all. As they walked through the wall, he could feel the lingering gazes of the people around them. Kids, smaller and older than him would stop and watch them with curious glances as they passed. They probably thought he couldn't see them. Once they entered, she herded him towards a small bed in the corner. The room was small but he didn't really care. With one last huff, she retreated. Back to the hallway, leaving him to settle on his own. Days turned to weeks, as he slowly but surely got used to his new home. By now, he could navigate the building with little to no hindrance. His senses and awareness increasing by the day. The kids there were mostly avoiding him though. At first, they had tried talking to him but no one had the courage to get close to the creepy new kid. The blind green-haired boy that never seemed to smile or laugh. They were intimidated by dull green eyes and the scar that adorned the left side of his face, crossing vertically, splitting his eyebrow and going all the way down his cheek. He could sense their nervousness whenever he walked in the room. He could feel their lingering gazes following his every move as if he was a wild animal on display. Their looks made him uncomfortable but he couldn't get himself to care. Soon enough, they had gotten used to his presence and opted to just ignore him. However, not all the kids acted like that. There was one group of boys that weren't satisfied with just staying away. Rumors had spread in the orphanage about the blind kid that didn't interact with anyone. Somehow, they had found out about his quirklessness and some of the older boys took it as some kind of challenge. The leader of the group, Denji, one of the oldest kids of the orphanage, was particularly adamant on making Izuka's life a living hell. He'd find one way or another to torment him, whether it was senselessly beating him up with his friends or just making fun of him and his disability and his worthlessness. Izuka cursed. Under his breath as he recognized the figure that was marching straight towards him, followed by two other boys. Oh, look who we have here fellas. It's none other than Midoriya himself. He announced proudly as he shoved Izuka with his shoulder. You need to look where you're going. Can't you see I walking there, you idiot? The boy scoffed, earning a couple of snickers from his followers. Wanting to avoid any problems, Izuku elected to walk away, keeping his head low as he hoped that this would be the end of the encounter. Life wasn't that easy though. Where are you going rat? Are you seriously ignoring me you, worthless idiot? Frustration and anger were apparent in the older boy's tone, but Izuku kept walking. He didn't have the patience for this. However, this was the wrong move because just as he was taking a step forward, Denji used his quirk to attract his metal stick towards him, tripping Izuku in the process. Denji had a moderately powerful electromagnetic quirk. He could attract any metal object towards him. This particular power, 
allowed him to intimidate and basically lead the kids here. Lifting himself off the floor, Izuku ignored the burning from the newly acquired scrapes on his knees. However, before he could steady himself, Denji had closed the space between them, using Izuku's own stick to hit his back. Pain flared down his spine, as the metal connected with his back at full force. He wheezed as the breath was knocked out of him. Yet, before he could regain his bearings, another blow to the stomach sent him tumbling to the ground again. His glasses falling to the ground, in the process. Stay down rat. The boy huffed, throwing the walking stick at him before he walked away. His two friends, each one taking a turn in kicking him and crushing his glasses before following the boy's lead and leaving. Izuku doesn't know how much time passed as he stayed there, sprawled on the floor. His sense of time was non-existent with his current state. Slowly, he got up, wincing as pain erupted from his newly formed bruises. Picking up his skewed glasses and his walking stick, he made his way back to his room. He could hear the commotion downstairs, signaling the beginning of dinner. Oh well, no one would care if he didn't show up either way. Weeks turned to months and it was getting harder and harder for Izuku. Every day, he would lose a little bit more of himself. Like the memories of his old life, the kind memories of his mother were slowly fading away. His thoughts plagued by the things he lost, good and fun moments replaced with more and more suffering. The only highlight of his days now were the times where he was allowed to hang out in the orphanage's courtyard. Going outside, smelling the fresh air made it easier for him to relax. To ignore the constant flow of information that accosted his brain. He could focus on the beautiful scent of the flowers and plants that surrounded him. He would sit there for hours, listening to the soft flow of the water coming from what he assumed to be a fountain in the middle of the courtyard. Drinking in the radiating heat coming from the sun and enjoying the peaceful silence. Izuku had found the perfect spot, concealed by the bushes around him, he would sit alone away from the playing and laughing children. Away from the world that surrounded him. He wished he could see the flowers again. He wished he could see the grass and the trees. He wished he could see the world again. He was beginning to doze off when suddenly he felt movement next to him, stiffening on instinct. He waited with bated breath for the figure to say something. The man was tall, his silhouette outlined in a way that hinted and gave away a well-toned body. Izuku opened his mouth to speak but the man beat him to it. Hey kid, mind if I sit here? The disembodied voice was gruff, it gave off an impression of an older man. Eh sure. Izuku didn't know what to feel about this, the man sat next to him. Close but keeping a proper distance between them. He knows everyone here, their silhouettes had long since been etched into his mind. However, he had never seen this man before. The name's Ryu, what's yours? Midoriya Izuku silence hung between them as the man hummed under his breath, the tune oddly familiar. You know Midoriya Ryu began slowly it's a really nice day today. His tone was light and uncaring. Izuku didn't know how to respond to that. Would you like me to describe it to you? He asked earnestly. With a little bit of hesitance, Izuku nodded. He would be lying if he said that he didn't yearn to be able to see the sky again, gaze at the onslaught of bright and vibrant colors that painted the world around him. To see. Well, the sun is brighter than usual, the flowers. Surrounding the yard are made of every color you could imagine, there are roses and sunflowers. Beautiful, red, and yellow are the most prominent colors here. Um, there's a small fountain in front of us, the sun hits the statue just right, making it shine and shimmer in the heat. The sky is a perfectly clear blue, no clouds in the vicinity. Izuku can't help the pit that forms in his stomach at the thought that he'd never be able to see the beauty this man was describing. At least it's how I imagine it to be kid. This, however, makes him pause. Imagine? W what do you mean? I can't actually see it, kid. Yet, there's nothing stopping me from imagining it, is there? He replies with a huff, the slight change in his breathing makes. Izuku think that the man is smirking. Are you are you, blind? The last word comes out as barely a whisper, the confusion and shock obvious in the boy's tone as his expression twists in disbelief. Been blind for years. Ryu's heartbeat is steady through the whole interaction, this man wasn't lying. How can he imagine something so vividly and beautifully if he's never seen it? You know kid. I've heard a lot about you, I've been here for a few days and the people here sure as hell talk a lot. He chuckles lowly. You've been through and lost so much in such a short time. But believe me when I say that I understand what you are going through. I lost my sight in a fire on one of my missions. 
It was hard, at first. But my friends and family were there for me when I needed them and, believe me when I say that it does get better. You may feel alone right now like the world is against you but a little hope, some kind of determination to be better, to do better will go a long way. The words hit Izuku hard, knocking the breath out of him as his mind went a mile a minute. He wanted to scream at the man for thinking he understood what he was feeling but he couldn't, could he? Ryu. This blind man sitting next to him understood. He had survived an accident just like Aizuku, even ended up blind. If anyone comprehended him it was this man, right? Can he hope to get better? Is he not too far gone? Too broken to be able to get back up? What could Aizuku say to something like that? A lump formed in his throat as the dam finally broke. Weeks of pent-up emotions breaking and rushing. To the surface. Aizuku cried that day, he cried for his mother, the most loving and caring woman he ever knew the woman that gave up everything for him. He cried for a world he would never be able to see again, if only in his dreams. And finally, he cried in relief, relief settling in his chest as a tiny ray of hope shimmered to life, maybe he wasn't broken beyond repair. He doesn't know how much. Time passed as he held on to this man, his hands shook with every sob that racked his body, knuckles white as he clenched the fabric of the man's shirt like a lifeline. This man, this stranger had managed to break through the walls he'd put up around himself with just a few words. Ryu kept whispering comforting words to him, rubbing circles on his back as he slowly calmed down. Time went by as. Izuku recovered. He'd talk more and react more. The light in his eyes was ever so slowly returning. The blankness in his expression was fading away with every stroll he'd take in the courtyard with Ryu. Their outing had become a daily occurrence, the bond between them was growing with every passing second. This man managed to get through the boy's thick walls and was slowly saving Izuka from drowning in his own bitterness and sadness. These past few weeks, they had learned a lot about each other. Izuka learned that Ryu used to be an underground hero before he retired. He lost his sight a long time ago, while he was on one of his patrols. A fire had erupted in one of the apartment complexes on his route. However, the incident didn't stop him from being a hero. He worked hard and trained and learned to adapt and he managed to save so many people because of his determination and hard work. He later retired when his age was no longer suited for hero work. However, Ryu couldn't stay forever and try to see Izuka whenever he could. Yet, in the short time they spent together, the man had lit a fire in Izuka. His dream didn't seem too far from his reach anymore. The man promised Izuka that he would train him, he would help him hone his sense and he would teach him how to fight and defend himself. The man would help Izuka learn that his blindness wasn't something that would hinder him. He would learn how to use it in his favor. It will require a lot of work but Izuka was prepared to do anything to accomplish his dreams. Life was short, Izuka knew that all too. Well, he was going to make a difference and save as many people as he could. Welcome back guys to another video don't forget to subscribe and let's started chapter 1. Lost Chapter 1 Infamous Vigilante, Shadow Strikes Again? Today at relatively 6 p.m., the well-known vigilante, Shadow, took down one of the largest drug cartels in Japan, Musodafu. The vigilante, who has been escaping police and hero custody for two years now, evaded once again capturing. However, we need to ask ourselves, with everything that he's done for Japan, can we really consider Shadow a villain? Tell us your opinion Izawa turned his television off with a huff, it's been two years since the first appearance of Shadow, a mysterious vigilante that always manages to escape both the police and the hero's grasp. It's been almost two years since Izawa, better known as the underground hero. Eraser Head joined the pursuit of the vigilante. Shadow is one of the very few people that ever managed to escape him. Shadow always gets the job done never lingers long enough to get captured and most importantly never leaves any trace behind, except for the usual note, that was either really useful in their cases or just another joke. Izawa was getting more and more frustrated by the day. This vigilante isn't like the others, he's gained a lot of support from the public. He made a name for himself by patrolling the slums and the neglected part of the city. Places where heroes don't usually go. Also, by taking down the villains that the heroes don't realize exists until they're caught. As time went by, people started calling out for him. They started calling for the shadow, the hooded figure that somehow always manages to hear their call for help. He was a hero to most people but a damn frustrating one in Shouta's opinion. 
He was cut off from his line of thought when his phone vibrated in his pocket. There, in bold letters on his screen was the name of the detective in charge of the vigilante's case. Speak of the devil, I guess. He thought bitterly as he answered the call. Tsukachi, is there a reason you are calling me at this hour? His usual monotone voice didn't betray the slight curiosity he felt. Eraser head, Shadow was just spotted stopping a store robbery on 24th Street. If we go now, we can ambush him. I'll be there. He replied, his tone serious and calm. This was their chance. Maybe they can finally find out who he was. He'd make sure that. This time, this time would be different. This time, he was going to catch the slippery bastard. Izawa picked up his capture gear and with that, he was on his way. He had a vigilante to catch after all. Izuka believes that today was a good day, an exhausting day, but a good day nonetheless. Today he had finally put an end to one of the drug cartels that used to rule the streets of Musodafu. It's been three months since he initially started their pursuit and he finally managed to put an end to their crimes. However, his day didn't end there because not half an hour ago, he was caught up in an armed robbery down the 24th street. Some idiots thought it would be easy to just steal from the old lady working there. Man were they wrong. Izuka can still hear their high-pitched screams as they tried to run away from the granny with the knife quirk. Yet, he couldn't help the bad feeling he was getting. Years of experience made his instincts as sharp as ever. He learned to trust them and they have never failed him, once. He just hoped that whatever was about to happen, he would get through it unscathed. As he ran, jumping from roof to roof, he tried to listen in for any kind of distressing noise. Over the years, he had honed his senses and trained his powers. He was able to hear everything around him. From the news playing in the living room of some civilians a couple of blocks from here, to the heartbeats of the people currently walking in the streets below him. Izuku likes his night patrols. He likes the quiet. He made sure to always be on high alert though. If someone needed help, he'd be there. It's been two years since he started hitting the streets as Shadow, a hooded vigilante. His training and hard work had paid off, enabling him to finally make a difference and help people. Even though it was illegal, he didn't really have any other choice though, did he? He jumped down an empty alley, deciding that he was done for the day. However, whatever plans he had, were shot out the window as soon as he felt a slight change of wind behind him. He could hear the all-too-familiar heartbeat of the underground hero himself. Eraser head. Ducking to the ground and rolling, he easily avoided the capture weapon that was being thrown his way. He could hear a huff coming from the man that was now standing in front of him. It's over shadow, give yourself up. The police are surrounding the place. The hero said, his voice neutral, tone calm. However, Izuku could hear the slight alteration in his heartbeat, betraying his calm demeanor. Yet, it indicated no sign of lying. Izuku stayed silent. This was the first time, the hero managed to get this close to him. Now, you may be wondering how a 14-year-old teenager ended up being an infamous vigilante. They say that it takes losing everything you love to realize what they truly mean to you. This is the story of how Izuku Midoriya lost everything he ever loved. The blazing sun beats down on the concrete floor of the neighborhood sidewalk. Izuku Midoriya limps home, his posture stiff, shoulder hunched and head down as his mind goes through the events of the past few hours.